Hi everyone. So today we're going to talk about general health and how to do the health assessment of a horse. And before we talk through a number of different assessments, let's first mention the behavior of maybe horses in a pasture or in a stall. And if you're going to be the ones that own those horses or manage those horses, you're in charge of their welfare. Okay. And so when you go out each day, you should be feeding and walking around those horses, making sure there's no cuts, scrapes, abrasions, uh, looking at water buckets and troughs, making sure they're drinking. If you go out to a pasture and a horse is way off in the distance, isolated, doesn't come up with the rest of the herd, that's something you should go investigate, look into, okay? They're social animals, they're herd animals, generally they stick together. Um, if you go in a stall, there well, might be some abnormal things. Okay, you go in the stall this morning and all of a sudden shavings are all pushed up against the wall. Maybe that horse is rolling, thrashing a lot overnight. Okay, doesn't immediately mean something's wrong, but let's do a health assessment. Let's investigate further. Okay, you go in that stall and haven't been in it since yesterday and water buckets are still full. Horse isn't drinking. Well, maybe they're dehydrated for some reason. Let's do again a further assessment on things. Um, you walk in that stall and there's no manure at all. Okay, could be cause for concern. Maybe we were worried about some impaction. Maybe there's diarrhea everywhere. Maybe you recently changed the feed. And so you need to always pay attention to things when you're around horses, again, in that stall environment, in that pasture environment. We are the ones that, again, are in charge of their care. And it's very important that, uh, again, we pay attention to uh, every little thing. And so we're gonna talk through, again, a number of different assessments. The first one that we're going to talk about is what we might refer to as attitude and we'll just say and stance, or some people might refer to this as mensha, okay? And so we can talk about that healthy normal horse, okay? The healthy normal horse, what should they be doing? Okay, they should have ears up, they should have eyes relaxed, their ears might be following the environment, um, relaxed. Uh, this is a horse that might be standing somewhat squarely, they might cock a leg a little bit, um, but again, this is a, a very normal horse. We could talk about that abnormal horse that's maybe flaring nostrils, acting dull or lethargic, um, showing maybe white of the eyes, what's going on. Uh, and so again, you're paying attention to their attitude or stance. Um, again, when we say standing square, I'm not saying that we stand on all, all four perfectly square, but they're not stretched out. Generally, that horse is stretched out. They're acting a little bit painful. Uh, if there's somebody that's acting a little laminitic, they might be rocked back on uh, those front legs a little bit. Okay, and so pay attention to their attitude and their stance. Generally, again, their ears and uh, head is kind of following the environment. Okay, listening on sounds around them. If we move past the attitude or in stance, kind of the first real one that we're going to talk about would be our mucous membranes, okay? And so let's talk about mucous membranes. We can abbreviate this MM. And so what are mucous membranes? Mucous membranes are the inner lining of our body structures that come in contact with air. Okay? And so this would be the inner lining of the oral, the rectal, the vaginal cavities. And this is something that we're going to look at, mainly at the gums, to be able to evaluate. Okay? And so let's talk about mucous membranes. What's normal? And so normal mucous membranes, you guys need to be able to mention both color and texture. Okay? Normal mucous membranes in terms of color are going to be pink, and then they're also going to be what? moist, wet, slippery, however you want to describe them in one of those similar words, okay? Um, if the horse just took a drink from the water bucket, again, wait a little bit before you turn around and assess those mucous membranes. Um, but again, generally speaking, they should be pink, moist, wet, slippery. If they are dry and tacky, that is an indication of a horse that is dehydrated, okay? We can do a further assessment on that. If they move beyond pink, and all of a sudden they are red, blue, yellow. These are all abnormal colors, okay? And so as you have a horse that moves from maybe gums that are bright red, and then all of a sudden we could go to maybe brick red, purple, blue, okay? Horses' gums that are bright red might be indication of dehydration, endotoxin release, shock, as they move from bright red to brick red, this is the worsening of that condition. Um, and then all of a sudden, as you move from brick red to purple blue, uh, again, your horse is severely compromised at this point. You might see a toxic line on the gums. 
um, but uh, they're in trouble, okay? Um, and so again, paying attention, again, they should be pink in color. Older horses, they might be a little more pale, but they should still be, uh, again, hopefully more towards pink in color. Uh, yellow would also be an abnormal color, okay? So if you see uh, yellow kind of ictric membranes, uh, maybe you've seen babies before in pictures that uh, these babies are yellow, you know this as uh, jaundice. But when you have these ictric membranes, the sclera of the eye, you'll also see as yellow. This is usually evidence of a liver or red blood cell problem. In foals, this could be the result of a condition referred to as NI, neonatal isoerythrolysis. Okay? And all of a sudden, basically, those immunoglobulins in that mare's milk are starting to attack that foal's red blood cells and killing them off. And all of a sudden, you see these ictric membranes. And so you want to pay attention to these various mucous membranes in the horse. Okay? So we can move beyond mucous membranes. And next, let's talk about, we'll abbreviate it, CRT. But this is what? This is our capillary refill time, okay? And so, how are we going to assess capillary refill time? Well, the easiest thing to do is just to lift the upper lip of a horse's uh, uh, front head up, and so lift the lip up, and then on the gums, we're just gonna take uh, our thumb and right above those uh, front incisors, push on those gums and make sure it's not your fingernail, just the flat part of your thumb. Okay, we're not trying to dig any fingernail in and push on there. And all we're doing is evacuating the blood out of it. You could do the same on my hand or anywhere else. And so if I push hard and then all of a sudden I let go, it's white momentarily, but then all the blood rushes back. We're trying to see how quickly those capillaries refill. Okay, normal capillary refill time should be two seconds or less. Okay, two seconds or less. Um, if it uh, is a horse that uh, has just exercised, uh, obviously you would expect a quicker capillary refill time, okay? Uh, but we're just trying to see how quickly all that blood rushes back. If uh, it is a horse that all of a sudden has a longer capillary refill time, maybe you go touch their extremities, their lower legs, and they are cold as well. Um, you have a horse that uh, perhaps has some severe uh, vasoconstriction, okay? Um, and poor peripheral perfusion, okay? And so something that you wanna uh, keep an eye on. But capillary refill time should be two seconds or less. And so again, we're going through, we'll do this entire health assessment on a horse here in a bit, um, but just kind of working through again, looking at the general behavior of that horse, how they're standing, looking at those mucous membranes, making sure they're pink, moist, wet, slippery, capillary refill time, touching our finger um, to those gums. And again, should rush back uh, with blood in two, in two seconds. Next one we could talk about uh, would be our skin tint. You guys have probably have heard of that before, doing a skin tint test. I'm gonna put it in parentheses. This is essentially a measure of hydration level, okay? And so you can take and do a skin tint classically on the neck. Some people would prefer not to do it on the neck. Maybe it'll go over to the shoulder more. Um, and so when you do a, a skin tint, basically we're just pulling a tint of skin back and seeing how quickly it returns to that horse, okay? Horses generally have pretty elastic skin. This is a, like I said, a measure of hydration. Now realize older horses, their skin is not quite as elastic, so it might take them a hair longer, but generally speaking, this skin tint should take also two seconds or less, okay? To return back flat against that horse. If all of a sudden in a horse that's not older, you have a horse and it takes two to three seconds, this horse might be, you know, we could say seconds right here. This horse might be a, a mild 3% uh, dehydrated. Okay. If you have a horse that takes uh, five to six seconds to all of a sudden return back, this is probably about a, a 5% uh, dehydration. Okay. Um, all of a sudden you have a horse that's maybe, uh, you know, let's say eight to 10 seconds. Okay. We are probably closer to, uh, again, eight to 9% uh, dehydration. Okay. And so this is something that if you go in that horse's stall in the morning, water buckets are still full and you filled them yesterday afternoon, and you're looking at that water consumption, horse hasn't drank any, we're gonna start checking mucous membranes. Are they dry? Are they tacky? They're also gonna be dry tacky, as well as a really slow skin tint, okay? It's gonna take a while to return back to normal, okay? And so maybe we need to get some fluids in that horse, maybe we can give him some electrolytes to help get him to drink a little bit more, but that's something that you need to assess and investigate further, okay? So I'm going to erase this and then we'll continue on. Um, now we can talk more about our classic TPR, okay? And so you guys are probably used to hearing the term TPR. And so let's talk now 
about, we'll talk temperature first, since that's kind of the first of our acronym when we talk about TPR, right? And so we could talk about temperature in a horse. Now, these are all, like everything, they all have a range, okay? You can't just regurgitate and list a single number, you gotta list these ranges, okay? And so we're gonna say 98 to 101.5 degrees Fahrenheit for an adult horse, okay? Temperature, pretty easy to assess. Most people don't have a problem here, but it is a very good indicator of a problem with the horse. Anytime we have virus moving around, we have strangles moving through a barn, anything like that, we're gonna start assessing and checking temperature quite frequently, maybe once, twice a day, to see if horses are normal if all of a sudden they're spiking a fever, okay? And so, how is this assessed in the horse? This is assessed rectally, okay? You might have an old mercury thermometer. Those are kind of a pain. You just have to shake them out, move the mercury anymore. We can just take a simple thermometer like this, much that we'd use in humans. You can go buy this at a, a local pharmacy, uh, and this works uh, just fine. Do be nice to your horse. Take a little bit of Vaseline. We'll use some of that here today. You can spit on it. I don't really care, but add a little bit of lubrication to uh, the thermometer. You're basically going to just insert it into uh, the horse's rectum. You don't need to go past the display right here. You don't need to bury it, um, but you'll set it in, wait for it to beep, uh, and then see where that appropriate range is, okay? Horse that's just been worked, uh, you might expect it to be a, a little bit higher in temperature, okay? Might also relate a little bit to the ambient temperature outside. Um, and so again, don't freak out if all of a sudden maybe it's uh, 97 today. Uh, again, just again, pay attention to things. Know what's uh, normal for your horse. Some horses, again, this is a, a decent range. Some horses may average and sit around 100, okay? Um, or maybe they sit constantly around 98. And all of a sudden you go out tomorrow and it was classically 98 every day, but now all of a sudden it's 101. Well, that's still within the range, but for that particular horse, it's a bit elevated. Uh, and so it may be something that you pay attention to a little bit more, okay? Um, if you're going to go out and check Tim, ideally try to do it around the same time each day. You know, we're gonna check it each morning uh, and keep an eye on it. And again, you're gonna have some kind of diurnal uh, movement in that uh, temperature a little bit. And so again, if you check it at the same time, it's, it's gonna help you a little bit. And so again, just simply assess with a thermometer. Um, sounds silly, but I would stress to you in the mare, make sure you're going in the correct hole, okay? We don't need to take a non-sterile thermometer like this uh, and stick it into that mare's vaginal vault. I've seen it done. Uh, and so again, do make sure, again, we're trying to take rectal temperature, uh, not anything else. And so again, simple 98 to 101.5, but make sure you understand uh, the range, okay? Next thing we could talk about, uh, we'll talk about heart rate and pulse, okay? So we're gonna lump these two together. For a range, we're gonna say 30 to 40 beats per minute, okay? We'll just abbreviate that BPM, okay? 30 to 40 beats per minute, that's our range. And so a few things about heart rate. Now, heart rate itself, how do we generally assess that? Easiest way to do that is with a stethoscope, okay? And so I encourage you that if you're going to own a horse, you're gonna manage horses, either you or somewhere on farm, you have a stethoscope, okay? You can go to a local farm and ranch store, buy one pretty cheap. Now with the uh, advent of everything online, you can buy about anything you want. These are Litmans, uh, they're a little bit nicer. Again, buy a good quality stethoscope, it'll last you forever, okay? Um, and so with the stethoscope, we're gonna listen to that horse's heart. Where do we listen to it? We'll show you on that actual horse here in a bit, but we're gonna go on the left side of the horse, just behind the point of elbow, and then listen with our stethoscope, okay? Now, a couple quick things about that stethoscope. These earpieces, people constantly put them in wrong. Um, and so we're gonna do it like this, and it's gonna point into our ear canal. You do it like this, and it's gonna point towards the back of your ear, you're not gonna be able to hear a whole lot. The other thing I would tell you is, you don't wanna blow your eardrums out, but you might just lightly tap on this to make sure, again, this head is on. A lot of these heads on stethoscopes, and like this Litman, they'll rotate, as I'm holding it, 180 degrees, okay? And that's changing which side is active. And so you wanna be sure, that, again, the head, this largest one right here that we're listening to the heart, actually has uh, sound coming through it. Um, and so they also make, from a teaching aspect, which is pretty cool, uh, a teaching stethoscope, okay? And that teaching stethoscope looks something like this, okay? Still has one single head on it here, and the head still rotates 180 degrees, 
um, but now you have two sets of earpieces, okay? So one person can listen with you, one person maybe that's learning, uh, one person that's done it before, and say, yeah, that's it, move it around a little bit, oh, can you hear it now, etc. So teaching stethoscopes are, again, pretty cool when you're first starting out. This is something that you do need to practice, okay? Um, every horse has a little bit different of a heartbeat, some are fainter than others. If you have a horse that's high in body condition score, that's a bit overweight, obese, it's gonna to be tougher to hear that heart rate, okay? If they're in good flesh, uh, it's buried in there a little bit, okay? Some horses, it's really, really easy to hear. But the more horses you listen to, the better you will become at finding that heart rate and listening to it. When you are listening to that heart rate or pulse, you're gonna hear lub-dub, okay? That lub-dub, essentially, is equal to one beat. Okay, and so that's just the diastolic and systolic movements of the heart. Um, and so we're gonna count that as one beat, lub dub one, lub dub two, lub dub three, and so on. Easiest way is to listen with your stethoscope for 15 seconds and multiply by four, okay? And then we'll see if we're close and within that range. Um, if you have a horse that's in pain, what would you expect to happen with heart rate? Heart rate's gonna go up, okay? And so if their painful heart rate goes up, you have a horse that's colicky, heart rate's gonna go up. And so that's one of the things you can call your vet and say, hey, my horse is acting colicky. Go take their heart rate, go take their respiration and give them those vitals, okay? That's a good thing to do. Now, a lot of times you might have a vet or you might be used to on-farm horses acting colicky. Maybe we give them a dose of banamine. Banamine is an NSAID, it's a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drug. What that's gonna do is obviously it's gonna take away some of that pain, but it's going to reduce heart rate, okay? If you're gonna administer any type of NSAID and your horse is acting painful, take a heart rate and assess that heart rate prior to administering the NSAID, okay? Because that's gonna skew the value. If your horse is extremely painful, they're gonna push through, that heart rate's eventually gonna go back up, okay? But I wanna know what that heart rate was before you administered that NSAID. Uh, and so just again, one thing to pay attention to. So heart rate, again, assessing, listening to that horse's heart on the left side, just behind the elbow. We'll look at that. The other piece of this is pulse, okay? Now, if you don't have a stethoscope with you, uh, like this right here, um, you could feel with your fingers. We'll just take two fingers, and we'll look at this on a horse today, and we could feel a branch of the facial artery and go just under the, the horse's uh, mandible, kind of the mandibular pulse right there. Uh, it's gonna feel a little bit like a, a size of your pinky hair smaller, a little bit of a rope, and you can put some slight pressure on that, and you can feel the pulse as it goes by. That pulse is gonna be the same as that heart rate. The other pulse that you may sometimes hear about would be the digital pulse, okay? This would be on the lower leg, the distal limb, um, just on the, the back side of the fetlock, um, kind of, uh, again, the four to six o'clock or so. And again, if you have an issue of horse detecting laminitics and foot problem, we may all of a sudden look for that digital pulse a little bit, but uh, otherwise we're not typically assessing anything there, okay? So that's a little bit more about heart rate and pulse and what I want you to pay attention to. The last piece of that TPR equation um, that we could mention would be what? Respiration, okay? Sometimes people will abbreviate this, your RR for respiration rate. This, I'm gonna give you a range of 12 to 24, and then I'm gonna put BPM, but also know that this is now breaths per minute. So you could abbreviate like that as well, okay? So this low end, some people will take this from eight to 24, some people will go six to 24. There can be a pretty big range in respiration and that's fine. A few ways that you can assess it. You could take that stethoscope we just had, put that stethoscope on the horse's rib cage and listen to those lungs as they expand and contract. Pretty simple to just hear those and again, count the number of breaths that a horse has every minute, okay? We could also count it for 15 seconds, multiply by four, okay? Other ways that you can, you can just look at the horse and watch as that rib cage expands and contracts, okay? One other thing you might do um, is watch as the nostrils flare. The thing I caution you with that is some horses are reacting to something. If you put your hand underneath their nose and you're gonna watch their nostrils flare or try to feel it, um, they might be reacting to your hand, okay? And it might skew your number a little bit. Another way you might uh, read in a book or hear people talk about um, is to take a mirror and hold a mirror under the horse's nose and every time it bogs up, they're taking a breath. I don't carry a mirror with me too often um, and that's something that, again, you could use but they might also be initially reacting to it. And so again, all methods that you can utilize to be able to assess that horse's respiration rate. 
So this was our classic kind of TPR, if you will, and how to assess those. Again, you need to know an appropriate range for each of those, and you'd have to know how to assess them, as well as the previous ones we talked about. Again, if you go out and that horse, again, shavings are pushed up, hasn't drank any, go through and do a full health assessment on that horse. The last one that we'll talk about right here is gut sounds, okay? And so we'll say GI motility. This will be our last one for a discussion up here. So GI motility or gut sounds, right off the bat, are gut sounds good or bad? Hopefully you're telling yourself good. Okay, we want gut sounds. And so there's five areas that we can assess gut sounds, okay? We're gonna have an upper and a lower uh, on each side around the flank, and then we're also gonna have a ventral midline. And so if you take a horse, and we'll draw a really rudimentary diagram right here, and essentially you find the last rib, and then you find point of hip, okay? And you go halfway between those two, okay? We'll put a little X, okay? That is the upper that we're going to listen to, and then if you drop, we'll say six to eight inches, okay? This is going to be your lower quadrant. So we have our upper and our lower quadrants on both the left and the right side of the horse, okay? Last rib, point of hip, right in between halfway, upper quadrant, drop six to eight inches, lower quadrant. We can take our stethoscope and listen in this area for our gut sounds. On the left side of the horse, this is gonna be more consistent. On the right side of the horse, it's more of an intermittent sound, maybe a toilet flushing sound uh, that you'll hear every uh, 60 seconds or so. Uh, but you should hear a number of maybe up to two to four rumblings uh, per minute, okay? And so again, I do want you to uh, assess gut motility. Um, this is something that you could very classically draw a little diagram like this. This would be the left upper, left lower, right upper, right lower, and you could kind of write down what you heard in each quadrant. Ventral midline is another one. Um, I usually just have people initially listen to the upper and lower quadrants on both sides of the horse. Ventral midline, if you don't know the horse, I just don't want you getting up under there too much and getting yourself kicked. Um, but at the end of the day, we do want to hear gut sounds. Some people just take their ear and put it to the horse and listen. Stethoscope is going to be a lot more uh, higher clarity in terms of sound. Uh, and so this is everything that we're going to discuss in our general health assessment. You should be familiar with how to do all of this. Do you have a horse around? Just go practice this, okay? Go look and say, you know, don't wait until something's wrong to say, oh, I need to remember how to do a health assessment now, okay? Go out and there's nothing wrong with doing this on any horse. Do a skin tint. You're not hurting them for any of these procedures, okay? Um, lift their upper lip up and do your uh, check of mucous membranes and capillary refill time, okay? And I go through and assess your temperature, uh, heart rate, and respiration. Listen for some gut sounds. And so be in the habit of knowing how to do a health assessment. So when you go out to the pasture and that horse is isolated, you can go check on them and walk through everything like that. You go in that stall and something's a little off, you can work through that health assessment. And so with that, hope you have a better understanding of normal ranges, what each of these consists of. Let's go outside now, let's find a horse, and let's walk through a handful of these just to show you how they might be done, okay? Okay everyone, so I've got you outside at our willing candidate right here, and let's just talk through a little bit of that health assessment, okay? And so, first things first, we could talk about that uh, attitude and stance, that mensha. And so again, horse's ears are up, it's relaxed, head's up. Uh, again, standing for the most part pretty square, not stretched out. Uh, and so again, attitude stance I'm happy with. Ears are kind of moving around to the environment. She's alert, she's responsive to everything going on around her. She's not dull, lethargic, she's not flaring nostrils. Uh, again, I'm pretty happy with uh, that first assessment. Next thing we could do would be to assess our mucous membranes and our capillary refill time. And so again, I'm just gonna take the upper lip of this horse and just kind of look up right here. And so we can tell that these gums are pink. And again, in some older horses, they may be somewhat more pale, that's okay. Um, but we make, wanna make sure, again, they're not that bright red, brick red, purple, blue, anything like that, yellow. Those would all be very bad colors, okay? Um, but I'm happy with the color. If I rub my finger across them, uh, again, they're slippery, they're wet, they're moist. Um, and so again, when I feel my fingers afterwards, uh, again, I can feel that uh, sliminess, slipperiness, if you will, okay? If they're dry, tacky, remember, that's an indication that she might be slightly dehydrated, okay? The next thing that we could do would be to look at that capillary refill time. And I'm just gonna take my thumb and I'm gonna push it on the gums right here and let go. And you could see it was initially white and then really quickly that color came back. We'll see if we can't uh, have her let us do that one more time. So we push, let go, 
collar comes back pretty quick. Again, that should be a two seconds or less for that cap refill time. Make sure it's not your fingernail digging in, just the flat part of your thumb, pushing on their gums, evacuating those uh, blood vessels out, and then allowing them to refill, okay? So we're pretty happy with our mucous membranes and our skin tint, or excuse me, our uh, cap refill time. Next, we could do our skin tint. And so many people will do it on the neck. Some people would come over and do it on the shoulder, but we're just gonna take a tint of skin like this and then let it go, okay? Look how quickly that pops back, okay? And so it's near immediate, but that should also be something that's two seconds or less. Older horses, they have less elastic skin. It might take them a little bit longer for that to bounce back. Uh, and like I said, as it starts to exceed three seconds, uh, we have a horse that might be mildly dehydrated. Uh, if all of a sudden it takes five seconds to come back, probably five to 6% dehydrated. Uh, if it takes all of a sudden six to 10 seconds, uh, we might be kind of a 8% dehydrated, give or take, okay? But you just simply pull a tent of skin, let it return. You could take it on the shoulder as well, uh, and it should all bounce back pretty quick, okay? And so that is our measure of hydration. This horse is not dehydrated, uh, and so everything looks pretty good here, okay? Next thing we could do would be to, to really discuss our main TPR, okay? We talked about that temperature pulse respiration. I don't need to do them in that particular order, but the first thing I would tell you is, so right here is our ulna, okay? The ulna, as it comes up, uh, our radius, ulna is attached and fused. This is our point of elbow right here, okay? We're gonna go just behind point of elbow, left side of the horse. This is where the heart is closest, and we're going to listen, okay? You guys won't be able to hear, but make sure we put our stethoscope in correctly, and we're gonna come over and just listen. And so we find the heart, and once we find that, we'll hear this lub-dub pause, lub-dub pause. And we're gonna make sure that we count each lub-dub as one beat, okay? Lub-dub one, lub-dub two, and so on. It might take you a while, you gotta be patient, okay? And so when you first listen, if you constantly are moving that all over the place, you might not allow yourself enough time to actually find that heart rate. Uh, and so again, give yourself a chance to be able to listen and find it. If you wait for a few seconds, you don't hear anything, move it around slightly, push a little harder, okay? Um, if this horse has their, their left leg back a little bit, left front leg, you may take it and just slightly, again, get them to, to move it forward or move them around so that you can hear appropriately. If they're completely underneath themselves, uh, it might be in the way a little bit. And so that's where we're going to listen for uh, the heart rate. In terms of pulse, if you don't have a stethoscope around, a good, real easy place to be able to check pulse is a branch of the facial artery up under the mandible. So you can do this on the left or the right side of the horse. I typically do it on the left just because I'm over here. But if I take two fingers, and you can see right where I'm at under the mandible, and go practice, go find this. And so if I take two fingers and just kind of roll back and forth, I feel what is like a little rope. It's a little bit uh, smaller than my pinky, but I can roll that uh, under my fingers. I'm gonna then just hit, put my thumb on the outside of the mandible and then put slight pressure on that facial artery, branch up, okay? And all of a sudden I can, there it is, there it is. And I can feel that pulse as it goes by. That will match our heart rate, okay? And so we don't wanna push so hard that we occlude it, but I can very easily find that right there and then push on that, okay? And so I want you to be able to practice that on a horse and be able to find it, because maybe you don't have a stethoscope around. And so that would be one way that you can assess heart rate or pulse. In terms of temperature, um, and so in terms of temperature, we're just gonna simply take that temperature and uh, some Vaseline and we're going to assess the rectal temperature of the horse, okay? And so when we do that on a horse, um, again, be nice to your horses. Uh, we could take Vaseline like this, you could spit on the thermometer, I don't much care, but at the end of the day, use some type of lubrication. You can buy a, a thing of Vaseline like this, keep it in your tack room, vet room at your barn, and it'll probably last you forever, okay? Um, and so, again, all we do, put a little bit of lubrication on this, and we'll go ahead and turn it on and then to take rectal temperature uh, again idea a good idea if you don't know the horse especially stand off to the side maybe a little bit um, you don't need to get kicked or anything we're going to stand close as well um, so she couldn't get her full force behind her and again make sure top hole rectum not vaginal vault and we'll just stick this into mare's rectum and we're going to wait for that to beep and again we're just sticking it in up to the display we're at 96.5 right now okay and so it just beeped, we can see we're at 99. 
So we just took that temperature. Real quick, one thing I'll remind you of, uh, again, it's a rectal temperature, so the thermometer is a little dirty right now. Please do take an alcohol wipe or even just some soap and water under the sink and clean this off before you go and stick it back in this nice little sleeve, okay? If you're the one that sticks it back in a sleeve like this, you get to clean it all out, okay? Not a very fun process. And so we'll set this aside um, and then we'll take this into the vet room and again, take some alcohol, soap and water or something like that uh, and clean it up, okay? And so we've walked through, again, a good number of our health assessments. Next thing we could talk about is respiration. Now, a few ways to assess that, okay? We don't need to do it, it's a pretty basic one, um, but we could take our stethoscope, place it on the horse's rib cage, listen as those lungs expand and contract. We could just simply watch the rib cage. And uh, again, there's a pretty big range. We said 12 to 24, you could take that down all the way to six to 24 breaths per minute, okay? Um, and so we could just watch this rib cage. It's all of a sudden it expands and it contracts, okay? Um, and so she just took a breath. We could also uh, watch the nostrils, okay? And we could look at her nostrils maybe as they flare and all of a sudden she takes a breath. And so you can see there, she had taken one a second ago. She just wanna be sure she's not reacting to something, okay? Generally, if you stick your hand under, she might think you have a treat or something like that and you can see her kind of looking at my hand. So you might skew your result a little bit. But respiration would be uh, our last piece of the TPR. The only other one that I'll mention to you guys before we talk about a few other key points um, is gut sounds. And so with gut sounds, we could take and find our last rib right here. Okay, she's in pretty good flesh, but I can feel the last rib. You can push, you're not gonna hurt anything. Here's my point of hip right here. We come right in between the center of those. This would be our upper quadrant. We can take our stethoscope, put it on, listen right here. And then we could also lower six to eight inches. Um, and this would be our lower quadrant, okay? And again, more consistent sounds on the left side. On the other side, the right side, more inconsistent toilet flushing sound or so. But again, you should hear gut sounds. That is the important aspect of that, okay? You should hear gut sounds. And so with that, now let's talk about some uh, methods of restraint and various routes of administration. Okay, so let's talk about some routes of administration. This could relate to a vaccination you're given, maybe in a repro sense you're given some oxytocin, or you're given a prostaglandin, maybe you're given some banamine because the horse is calling you, okay? There are lots of various routes of administration. The key is many different drugs, vaccinations are all designed to give a particular route. They might be able to go more than one. Maybe they can go IV or IM, but they are designed for a particular route of administration and it is very, very, very important that you adhere to that, okay? And so let's talk about some of our different routes of administration, okay? Our first of which could be intramuscular, okay? I am intramuscular. We could do our classic kind of triangle of the neck. We want the heart of the muscle right there, okay? When you give an intramuscular vaccination, it's a pretty long needle on there, okay? It might be a, a two inch needle sitting on there. Um, a lot of times what I will do is I will take a tint of skin and then we'll take our needle, push it straight in all the way to the base of the hub, okay? We'll pull back, aspirate back, make sure we're not in a blood vessel, uh, and then inject, okay? But it's meant to go in all the way, okay? Um, and so that is truly intramuscular. Again, could be given with intramuscular in triangle of the neck. We could give it in the pectorals, um, or sometimes you'll give it in this longitudinal muscle on the hind quarter right here, okay? For something that's really, really thick, um, sometimes I like this muscle right here. We can tap a few times, all of a sudden inject, pull back, and make sure we're not in a blood vessel. But if you have a really thick substance and you're riding that horse, you give it on the neck, they might have a little bit of a swelling. It might be pretty sore on the neck, and maybe they're not gonna bend from left to right quite as easily. And so if you give it on the hind quarter back here, man, they're constantly walking, they're moving around. You don't see too much of an injection site reaction. The other thing I would tell you, with given intramuscular vaccina or vaccination treatments, anything like that, um, is say you're gonna do vaccinations, okay? Um, give things on different sides of the neck, okay? If I, I would do flu rhino here, and we do tetanus on the, the other side, okay? Um, that way, if all of a sudden, and you do the same for all the horses in your herd, that way if you go over the next day and you see a big injection site reaction right here, I know this was because of the flu rhino vaccine, okay? It's important that you can then distinguish. Uh, also, if you're given something every day, okay? Switch up the side of the neck, okay? Don't do everything in the exact same injection site every single day. Help your sort horse out, okay? If it's large volumes, uh, you might redistribute into a, a different area, okay? And so that's one method of, uh, of, of administration or route of administration. Another one could be IV, okay? Our classic uh, method for intravenous 
um, is the jugular. Okay, we have a jugular groove on both the left and the right side of the horse. Uh, more often than not, this is where we are either going to draw blood or administer an IV injection. Okay. And so if you take this, I can all of a sudden, we'll see if you guys can see this on camera, I can occlude this and all of a sudden this blows up a little bit, like a balloon, okay? I can now feel that jugular, okay, that vein right there. And then when I let go, watch it collapse, okay? We'll all of a sudden let go. You can see the whole thing collapse back down. Let's blow it back up. And then all of a sudden, again, you can see this hallway. I can palpate that jugular. So very easily I could draw blood from it um, or I could inject something. We let go and all of a sudden here, it just completely collapses, okay? But again, we have a jugular on the left and the right side. And so this is where we're going to do common intravenous. Sorry, we got choppers flying over us a little bit today. Uh, but hopefully you understand a, a little bit about uh, IV. So that would be our second route administration. We could also talk about sub-Q. Sub-Q, uh, we've given some allergy shots, other things sub-Q, meant to be given just under the skin. So you'll have a little bit of a bubble um, between the skin and the actual muscle, okay? A couple other routes of administration, we could talk about PO uh, or oral medications. Uh, and so we commonly, maybe you give some SMZ or some Bute or something else orally. Um, other one would be intranasal. Not too much is given intranasal. Strangles vaccine would be one of those that's given intranasal. Horses are not a fan of it, um, but we'll have a, a little bit of a uh, small little tube on the end of our uh, uh, syringe, and we'll just simply stick that up that horse's nostril um, and uh, inject, okay? And she thinks we've done something we haven't. Um, and so again, that's a handful of different routes of administration, whether it's IM, IV, our sub-Q, our oral PO, or our intranasal. But again, the key is whatever the route administration that that drug or that vaccine is intended to go, make sure you do that. I've seen too many times where somebody just guesses or assumes that's a very bad thing to do, okay? And so you absolutely need to know the route administration that that drug or that vaccine can go. Now let's talk about some various methods of restraint, okay? And so in terms of methods of restraint, this might be for any number of reasons. Maybe you are uh, having your farrier out um, and your horse has been good for three feet, but man, that, that last foot, they just, they don't wanna have any more patience. They don't wanna stand still. Maybe it's for you to give a vaccination, okay? Your horse is not a big fan of vaccinations, not keen on it, okay? Maybe it's to do an ultrasound, okay? Horse just needs to stand still a little bit more, have some patience, you don't want him to kick anybody. There's all various methods of restraint you might use, and you have to figure out what you can use in your toolbox to be able to restrain that horse. Uh, and so right off the bat, um, some easy ones that we could do, they're all considered methods of restraint. We might be able to just take a, a, a leg and lift that horse's leg up and hold that. And maybe this restrains that horse and keeps him from moving around a little bit. Um, obviously, if it's your farrier and that's the object you're trying to accomplish, probably not gonna be very key and helpful, okay? Um, but if you're trying to get them to stand still for some other procedure, uh, then that could be uh, helpful and beneficial. We could also do something like a shoulder roll or a neck roll, okay? This is another method to be able to restrain that horse, okay? And so you can do that on a number of horses and again, get them to take their mind off something else, release a little bit of endorphins. Um, and again, you could do this, she'll stand still um, and maybe this allows us to ultrasound or to do a number of things. If I don't have a twitch handy, we'll talk about some twitches in a moment. This is one of those uh, kind of next best things that I could do, okay? I'm okay with uh, doing kind of the neck roll, shoulder roll to get them to uh, stand still, restrain them a little bit. I'll be the first to tell you, some people will do it. I am not keen and not a fan of ear twitches. Some people will take an ear and they'll basically fold it in half and just twitch that ear a little bit. It is a method of restraint. Um, just in my experience over time, uh, you do that on a lot of horses and they become very head shy horses. This horse doesn't care if I touch their ears and do anything. Uh, you twitch a lot on the ear and that horse is not going to allow you to do that. They're all of a sudden going to throw their head up in the air. Um, and uh, again, I want them to be able to allow me to touch their ears just like I am now. So anytime you're putting a, a bridle on and that head stall comes over the top, uh, they're not flinching and throwing their head up in the air. And so again, I would rather choose a, a different method of restraint that is not uh, doing something with an ear twitch. I want them to, to again, not have a, an adverse reaction to that. So we could do that shoulder roll, we could pick it up. We could also look at a, a handful of different twitches that exist, okay? And so I'm gonna grab a, a number of different twitches here. 
And there's three different types, okay? They're all accomplishing the exact same thing. Um, we'll look at one here in a moment and see how that actually works when we put it on. Um, this first one I'll mention is my least favorite. I don't really use this one, but it's out there. Um, and so this is a twitch that you can buy from any farm and ranch store. Um, and this basically, all of our twitches, and we'll talk about it and put one on in a minute, all of our twitches are going to go on the horse's upper lip right here. And so we're gonna take just like that and twitch this horse's upper lip. You can see she doesn't care. Um, it's going to release endorphins, relax. You're gonna see eyes kind of roll back and they're gonna go off in the la la land, okay? And this is gonna allow us to, again, maybe ultrasound the horse, give that vaccination, do whatever we need to do to be able to accomplish that. This, again, hooks onto that. You cannot get enough pressure. That horse's upper lip is strong, okay? There's a lot of muscle there. You cannot get enough pressure with just your fingers to be able to adequately touch that horse. And if they move their head around, uh, it's not gonna last, okay? Um, and so this twitch, again, is gonna be something that you can clip on. You can see at different uh, uh, openings right here in terms of how big that horse's nose is. I don't like this. The reason I don't like this is if all of a sudden that horse starts shaking their head, throwing it around, you got a big old piece of sharp metal that's now attached to that horse's head, okay? And I don't want to get knocked out by something like this. And so, yes, it's there, maybe a last resort, but that would not be my go-to, okay? These two twitches um, are gonna be much, much better, okay? Only difference, one is a chain, one is a rope. I don't care which one you use, they're gonna have the same effect. Um, only thing I've heard from some people, maybe to keep in mind as a difference, is if you're gonna keep it on for a long period of time to accomplish a procedure, when you tighten this chain one down, the chain naturally has gaps throughout it, okay? Um, and so maybe you have a little more blood flow in this, whereas if it's for a long period of time, short time with a twitch, not gonna uh, have any problems whatsoever. But when you put this uh, rope one on, again, it's very tight all the way around. There's no gaps in this when it's on that horse's upper lip or nose. Uh, and so again, that's just one thing as compared to the chain for a long period of time, this chain may be more advantageous. Um, but again, these are both on a pole. Okay, the advantage to this, um, if a horse is maybe twitch wise a little bit, um, we might need to have a, a helper um, in putting this on. This horse could care less, um, and so she's a, a good candidate for us. Uh, and so I'm just going to take this, and once I do this, we'll just spin our twitch down. Okay. And then even if somebody else helped me put this twitch on, I'm going to then take it from them and I'm going to then hold that horse and once they have the twitch on as well as the, the actual lead rope, I'm gonna hold both, okay? That way if the horse backs up, I can back up with them. If the horse moves forward, I can go forward with them. It's not me and another person tripping over each other while we try to restrain that horse, okay? It does no harm to the horse. I promise you we can take it off. She could care less afterwards. Um, and she might initially, again, take a second. Hey, little. Um, she might initially take a second to uh, relax a little bit, but it is going to release some endorphins. Um, eyes are going to relax a little bit, um, and then all of a sudden you're going to see this kind of calm behavior. Um, and again, she was already pretty calm before, but it might allow us to ultrasound that horse. And so twitching is something that, again, very non-invasive procedure that we can easily do. Again, her eyes are glassing over right now if you look at them. Um, and so, again, she's very, very relaxed right now, releasing those endorphins. And so once we're done with this, this is something that we can very easily just undo. We can take this twitch off. Um, and then I like to kind of take my hand and kind of rub their nose a little bit. Again, I don't want them to have any adverse reaction, any problem with me ever touching their nose. Uh, and I want them to be good with me uh, kind of playing with it. And so she can care less, doesn't hurt that horse at all. Um, and uh, again, it's a good method of restraint. Now. Again, those are all things that you could do to accomplish one of those procedures that we mentioned. Moving beyond twitches, really your next uh, modality that you would have would be chemical restraint, so sedation, okay? Um, and so then you could talk with your vet to maybe come out and maybe you have to complete a procedure and maybe you got a brand or you got to do something else um, and sedating them, okay? Maybe we're going to take some uh, x-rays or we're going to suture something up and so sedation might be your mess, best mean of uh, restraint. But if I literally need to do something that's gonna take me two seconds, man, I don't wanna have to sedate that horse and knock him out for 30 minutes just to complete something that's gonna take me two seconds to do sometimes. Maybe I have to pull a, a bandage off, okay? And they just need to stand still. I would much rather do a twitch or a shoulder roll than sedate them just to have to do that. If you have to, then so be it. But that's where you have to choose the best method of restraint in your toolbox and what works best for you, okay? Uh, obviously, sedating 
to be able to get the horse to stand still to give the vaccination is not appropriate, okay? Those don't actually work out well, okay? Um, and so you have to figure out what's gonna work best for you. And so lots of different methods of restraint that exist, and you can pick and choose what is best for the situation at hand. And so with that, hopefully now you understand a little bit more about how to do a health assessment on a horse, looking at their general health, when that might be appropriate, as well as various routes of administration and some methods of restraint that you might do. And so with that, we'll talk to you guys next time.